Now, through this whole series, we've been asking the question, in what sense is Jesus with us here and now? And we've been thinking through what the Bible has to say about that every week. And so this week we're thinking, well, how does Jesus communicate? How does he speak? And if he speaks now, what does he say to us? And how do we hear him speak? And I want to start, uh, just before I get into a particular passage, I want to start just by saying three things about God and speech in general. First of all, that our God is a speaking God. Our God is a speaking God. If you have no idea of who God is, maybe if you're very new to Christian, Christianity or what Christians believe, you might be thinking, well, how is God knowable at all? How do we know who God is? And uh, can we believe what he said about himself? Well, one of the things that is repeatedly said of God in the Bible is that he's a speaking God. And from the very first words in the Bible, in amongst those first words, and God said, let there be light. And what God's word does is bring order from chaos. God's word reveals who he is. So God does not hide in the shadows, attempting to cover over his tracks so that only the most worthy on the quest can find him. He speaks and he speaks so that everybody can hear and that anyone can come. And in fact, the reason God, the Holy Spirit, worked through authors to record the Bible is because he continues to speak through it. One book I once read a few years ago described the Bible as the dry, dusty pages uh, describing where God had once been. I think that's to misunderstand what the Bible is. It's the place where God continues to speak and to address his people because God wants you to know him and know him well. So our God speaks, first thing. Second thing, that when God speaks, God's words are powerful and accomplishes his purpose. His word, as Isaiah writes, never returns to him empty. And throughout the Bible, it's God's speech or God's breath that not just says, this is what I'm going to do, but it's his word that actually accomplishes it. So let there be light, and God speaks, and light is the result. Or in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So what he's, what he's saying is, as you read about Christ, God who said, let there be light, and there was light, as you listen, as you hear the word of Christ, he also says, let there be light, and there is light in your heart. So it's not just that God's words are true, but they are powerful. It's why when Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, who felt deeply spiritually weak, and he says, put on your spiritual armor, he says, the thing you need to hold out is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's the offensive weapon that you have in your hand. So sometimes it's, 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 it's like saying, so God's word is like a letter written to us, but it's also like a weapon with which uh, he addresses us to affect real spiritual power in our lives and the people around us. So sometimes uh, people say, don't they, oh, they read a passage of the Bible and say, these are some great truths as if they are sort of handling pearls, historic, beautiful things, but they need to be kept behind glass. Great truth sounds like something to be understood in our heads. But God's word is even more sharp than that. It addresses us. It speaks to us. These are not just abstract truths or historic truths. They are a call to faith and action. They are God's word addressing you, meeting with you, encouraging you, rebuking you, bringing life to you, feeding you. God's word is powerful. That's the second thing. And thirdly, God's written word bears witness to his living word. There is a way of thinking, isn't there? Oh, if I love Jesus, maybe I don't really need the Bible. You know, and you might think of John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word in John takes on flesh and makes his dwelling among us. And so now we have the Word of God who is Jesus. And so if the Word of God is Jesus, if he is the final Word that's been spoken, what real need do we have for the Bible? Well, I just want to remind you of a little incident that happened right at the end of Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus. After Jesus has been crucified on the cross, the disciples are all in shock. Uh, many of them just start to return home to their families to try and put their lives back together. 
And the resurrected Jesus goes to walk with two of the disciples along the road. And they're talking about everything that's happened and, you know, how shocking it's all been. And at first, they're quite surprised this mysterious man walking with them hasn't heard about Jesus and everything that's happened. But then Jesus addresses them. And this is what he says to them. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, what is Jesus doing? He's saying the whole Bible has been pointing forward to a day when the Son of God will be revealed as Savior. And the pattern of that Well, the pattern is always suffering now, glory later. In a fallen world, his glory is actually seen through his suffering. And when that's the long-term storyline of the Bible, well, what he's saying is all those long-term storylines of the Bible, well, they all find their final full completeness in Christ. The written word bears testimony to the living word. So things things like the narrative of creation, fall, redemption, recreation. And here is Jesus, the one who redeems creation and will set everything straight again. Or the theme of king and kingdom. Well, here is the king who has come to save his people. Or the theme of covenant. Here is the one who has come to fulfill God's promises and redeem his people. Or the theme of grace and law. And here is the one who's fully fulfilled the law and rescues his people as as an act of grace. Or the theme of the holiness of God versus idolatry. And here is the one who is truly worthy of worship. And by his redemption, he's truly set free all the people from their idolatry and reveals the face of the Father to us. So these are kind of long-term themes that all find their fulfillment in Christ. But it's not just in those big themes. It's all in the, the individual, the small types of Christ that you see all the way through the Bible. He's the new Adam, the son of God who actually obeyed. Rather than bringing death, he brings life. Or he's the true Noah who rather than just building a ship to shelter his family from the wrath of God, through his own body, Jesus shelters his people from God's wrath. Or the true David who is the king who really does lead and protect his people. Or all the smaller themes that you find across the Bible of land, of dust, of death, of hope, of rest, of justice, of comfort, of peace. All of them find their fulfillment in Jesus. So to know Jesus is to know, well, it's to know God's word, but it doesn't just speak of us to Jesus like a sponge full of liquid, and as you prod it, it just kind of oozes Jesus. But we love the Bible because, well, because it reveals to us who Jesus is. We love the Bible at Grace Church, and it's not just because we're kind of peculiarly bookish, okay? Actually, my preferred communication method, just for the record, is Netflix or YouTube, okay? But we love the Bible because we love Jesus, and the Word brings us back to Him, the Son of God. Now, I say that all by way of kind of a long introduction, but I want you to know that the Word of God continues to speak to us today and address us today. But how does that work out? If God is still speaking, how does that work? Well, I want us to go to one of the letters to written to one of the churches in Revelation and specifically the letter to the church in Thyatira in, in Revelation chapter 2. And it might sound quite strange to go to one of those letters because we've, in that letter, we've got some specific things that Jesus actually says to a, to a people, a specific group of people. And Jesus actually addresses it to the, the Apostle John to write down and say, you know what, I send this letter to the church in Thyatira. Now, you can say, well, hold on, that doesn't really prove the relevance of the word of God today because I am not here holding a letter from the Apostle John, well, at, from Jesus via the Apostle John to Grace Church, okay, specifically addressing stuff within our church. And that's because Jesus hasn't added to the Bible since that generation of apostles died out. But I think these kind of letters help us understand how Jesus continues to speak and what Jesus says to his churches now. So let me let me read um, uh, from from Revelation chapter two. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your faith and love, your service and perseverance and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. 
You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast on her a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to those who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, just by way of background, it's worth knowing uh, that the church in Thyatira was suffering. It was being persecuted. There were very powerful city guilds like trade unions, which excluded Christians. And it meant that very often people had to choose between being a Christian or having a job. Now, the simple solution to that was just for Christians to be seen at all the right places, worshipping at the right temples, finding a way of integrating their faith with the culture and, and the things that their culture worshipped. And Jesus wants to address those things very specifically. And I think he says three very specific things. Jesus sees, Jesus judges, Jesus wins. Those are the three things we see. Jesus sees. This is the first thing he says to the church. And verse 18, he starts by reminding us who he is as Jesus. He says, these are the words of the Son of God. Now, that's a very loaded term. It was very loaded for the people in Thyatira. Their emperor called himself the son of Zeus. They had a coin with the emperor on the flip side calling himself the son of God on it. Okay, so when Jesus announces, I am the son of God, it's not a neutral term. Jesus is saying, I am alive. I am the son of God. And then it describes him like having eyes like burning, blazing fire. It's a description that draws on Old Testament ideas of God who sees with holiness. He sees what is going on. And then he describes his feet are like burnished bronze, which is a very kind of weird image, but you have to think statues, okay? Bronze and the bronze statues last forever. And he's saying, I am rooted. I am the everlasting son of God who sees everything through my holiness. And the language of those three things actually come up in another part of the Bible, the famous story of Daniel. If you remember Daniel, he was carried off away from his homeland to a foreign and hostile territory where they wanted them to worship the emperor as God. And in fact, Daniel was sentenced to death with three of his friends because he refused to bow down to the statue of the king. And Daniel is told, beware the kingdom with feet of clay. Now, what is Jesus doing as he announced himself? He, Jesus is saying to this church under pressure, the same God who speaks to Daniel in the Old Testament speaks the word of the book of Daniel to you. I know your deeds. I know your love. I know your faith. I know your service. I know your perseverance. You're doing more than you did at first. They've kept on going. They're continuing to keep speaking about Jesus anyway, even when it's cost them very dearly. But he's saying the message for Daniel is the same message for you. The same God is speaking and speaking through the message of Daniel into the culture then. And he's saying the same thing to us now. When our culture says, you need to conform to whatever our culture says is king or God right now. The same God who speaks in the Old Testament is still speaking to us right now. If we listen to those passages, those stories are not just a record from which you're supposed to glean some general principles from. They are God addressing his people and he continues to address his people. He says he sees the same God in the Old Testament sees now. Secondly, Jesus judges and the letter actually explains, doesn't it? It describes a lady, a self-proclaimed prophetess who was teaching people it was okay to be sexually immoral, probably encouraging people in the church to, to keep their involvement with, in, the, in kind of temple worship. Mix your faith, your Christian faith, with the other local religions. And it's wrong. It's false. Jesus calls her a Jezebel. <laughs> okay, it's a very, very loaded term. You don't meet many children called Jezebel these days. 
She was a queen in the Old Testament married to King Ahab, one of the worst kings Israel ever had. Jezebel actually stopped people from worshipping God, seducing them, mixing their religion with, so, with local religions. It's got a name, it's called syncretism mixing religions together the sort of thing that sometimes you might hear taught you know to know god well you have to take this little bit of our god and this little bit of another god and you piece them together and she was teaching this saying it's okay it's what god wants you to do the feature of jezebel in the old testament is she hates what god says and she ends up killing people who point out her, her error the first thing the bible records her doing was killing god's prophets so a, that's the reason we don't call our kids Jezebel, okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, it's a lovely biblical name. No, we don't, we don't hear that very often. But Jesus gives her this name to make the connection, to say her teaching is leading people away from God, not towards God. And I guess at the time people thought, oh, she's insightful, she's a prophet, she speaks on behalf of God. But here's the Son of God saying, no, this isn't true. Same God speaks in the Old Testament who speaks now. And you think, well, I'm sure that's not a risk for us, okay? We, we kind of think, well, we're Christians or whatever. I'm sure what she was teaching was just something like this. We're Christians, we're free, our hearts are with Christ, our spirits and souls are with Christ. What we do with our bodies fundamentally doesn't matter. Our bodies aren't that important. We're free to join in the temple worship with other religions. It helps people see Christians are here for the good of the city and the culture. Jesus loves you. You don't need to be so uptight about your rules and regulations. You don't need to worry so much about holiness. Jesus loves you. He's given you spiritual life. And as long as you're spiritually alive, physically, you can do what you want, you know, and you've got to do what, you, what you've got to do to get by. He knows that unless you join him with the temple worship, you might lose your job. And Jesus would not want that. He loves you. Forgiveness is always available as well. So come with me to the temples. I'll show you the spiritual secret of how you can worship with your body without giving away your heart. And now, you kind of think, well, we don't see that now, do we? Well, be awake. You think you never fall for it. But all the time, every day, we risk mixing Christianity with other things. We risk Christianity with capitalism to get the prosperity gospel. Or we mix Christianity with nationalism, and we come away with some very strange racist beliefs that support some very strange and destructive policies. Or we mix Christianity with some sort of pseudo-spirituality and come away with a with a culture of just total tolerance. And we end up with this very kind of tepid Christianity that has no prophetic edge and basically says God doesn't speak and God isn't holy. And any of us can fall away with this. You know, our, our, our culture always basically essentially values money, sex, and power. And that probably means there will always be people inside churches promising us money, sex, and power. I'm, very, I'm sure very often they're nice, dependable people in other ways. But it's why we need God's word to speak to us and address it and not just say, oh, that's an interesting opinion. Or maybe that informs us of, of something in the background. As Jesus sees what is going on in this church, his word cuts through all the nonsense and says, no, you need to clear this out. The spiritual result of this is death. And in calling her Jezebel, I think Jesus is reminding us, God has spoken about this stuff in the past. The Old Testament does talk about situations when someone comes along claiming to be speaking for God, but draws away his people away from holiness. And yet because the Bible is old, historical, our temptation is to draw away from it. And what this lady was doing is she's making a claim that God has changed. God is speaking differently. And that his word to his church is now different we're called to follow the new thing. It's okay to follow the new thing. And yet to this little church, Jesus is making all of these Old Testament references deliberately to say, no, I have spoken. I, who spoke through the Old Testament, am still speaking the Old Testament into situations like this. My word is reliable for teaching my people. It's one of the reasons why we lean so heavily on the Bible. It's why we teach through books of the Bible, so that our view of God is formed from his word. And it's not just because we think, oh, that's safe, it's solid, it's true, that's all the case. But through it, he speaks. He still speaks through his word to his people. And then we come on to the final point, Jesus wins. So Jesus sees, Jesus speaks, Jesus wins. And he finishes uh, this letter to this little church in Thyatira again by reminding them of, of two particular promises. 
Firstly, he says, I will give authority over all the nations, and that is not a promise to political power in their generation, but he's saying to them, though you feel weak now and not in control and completely ignored by anyone in power, he's reminding them in the end, Jesus is still in control and there is nothing to be afraid of. Because even though things seem uncertain politically, there is not a need to try and mix your religion to gain influence with the world. Jesus is in control. All the time, all the time, in every generation, it feels like life is out of control and we need a new word of God to speak in and address it. You know, whether it's Brexit or Trump or coronavirus or whatever it is, the direction of travel for our culture is always away from Christianity. And we face this pressure to mix our religion to gain credibility in the, in the, in the eyes of the world. And Jesus just comes into that and says, it has always been thus. There is no need to worry. I have spoken about this. Now, Christianity, of course, was a minority religion when this word was spoken. But the gospel was still profoundly influential. It spread across the globe to the furthest reaches. I think in every generation, things feel weak. Every generation basically sees people around saying, Christianity will die. And yet worldwide, the church continues to grow. Why? Because Jesus continues to speak through his word. And then in verse 28, the second promise, I will give you the morning star. Again, it's a title, but it's an Old Testament reference for Jesus himself. He's saying, if you keep going, it is costly, but in the end, you receive Jesus. So keep going. As we listen to God's written word, or we listen to it because it is spoken by the Spirit through Jesus. And through it, he continues to speak today. Jesus has not left us alone. He is speaking. And I think we get to the end of this, this, this little passage, in, to, to this letter in Thyatira, and our cry, our prayer ought to be, Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us ears to hear. The issue is not God speaking. The issue is our hearing. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to pray that prayer, really. Lord, give us ears to hear. Lord Jesus, we struggle when the world says all sorts of different things, and we long for a new, a fresh word. We long to hear something different. And then we open our Bibles and we read about you. And we're drawn back again. We're reminded of your holiness. We're reminded of how all your promises have come good in you. That you are the one who directs us back to yourself and you have not changed. Lord, we pray, help us to believe it. Help us to cling on to you when things feel uncomfortable and discouraging and hard. Lord, we pray, help us to see. Help us to see and discern what the Spirit says to, to us through your word in this generation. Help us to listen. Help us to obey that we might be proven as, as, as your people to the end of time. Amen.